Hello again. Good to be back. Last time I talked about our farming operation and how it relates to a, a sustainable agriculture vision. The farm without the consumer is nothing. So this time I want to talk a little bit about local food systems. Some people evaluate the health of a food system by the cheapness of the food. And this is great for half of the equation, the consumer half. But it can be a little tough on the farmers. When food is very cheap, farmers end up having to get larger, having to compromise quality, and in the long run, we all suffer, and the entire food system has problems. If we look at the amount of the food dollar that the farmer gets, that has dramatically dropped over the last 50 years. It's gone from about 47 cents out of the dollar that the farmer used to get when we bought food to about 20 to 21 cents out of every dollar. The other 80 cents is going to processing of foods, to packaging, to marketing, to advertising. It's not going back to the farmer. And as a result, what we're finding is farmers are struggling. We have lost tremendous number of farmers and farms over the last 50 years again. If you look at this chart, just in the three Bay states of the Chesapeake Bay, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, we've gone from about 350,000 farms to about 100,000 farms, largely because farming is not profitable. So what I'm going to do is look at our farming operation and how we interact with the local food system and use that as a very limited example to talk about local food systems. With our farm operation, the marketing is critical to us for economics, for building community, in meeting many of the criteria that we have set for ourselves. Last time I talked about the farm operation, including organic vegetables, grass-fed beef, and the nursery operation. With the vegetable portion of the farm operation, we market it through what is known as a CSA, or Community Supported Agriculture. We have 280 families who buy a share of the farming vegetable operation. When they purchase that share, they pay $400 up front in March or April, and then from mid-May until the end of November, there are 26 weeks where they will come to the farm and get one share, one 280th, of all the vegetables that we grow. When families come out to the farm, they will see a little board that tells them what a share contains this week. And then they will themselves weigh out the vegetables. For instance, this week, we just started harvesting sweet potatoes. So it's five pounds of sweet potatoes. So our shareholders will come, they'll pick out their sweet potatoes, weigh them, and put them in the bags that they themselves have brought to the farm. With this system, a CSA, it's extremely important to have a lot of variety. So we grow 56 different vegetables on the farm, from garlic to squash to tomatoes, green peppers, white potatoes, onions, just about all the vegetables that you can imagine are grown on the farm. A second element of the farm operation is the grass-fed beef. And here you see young cows grazing on oats. These oats are specially planted in August so that the cows can graze them in the fall and it will provide the tenderest meat possible. The trick with grass-fed beef is to have tender meat. It's very easy for it to be rather tough. Our butcher, who's a small family meat producer up in Mount Airy, Maryland, said it's the best meat that he has worked with. So he was surprised himself that purely grass-fed beef could provide such nice meat. This meat then we sell directly to people who want to buy a quarter of a steer at a time and have a large freezer in which to store it. It's all antibiotic and hormone free. Again, this brings us a much greater return than if we were to take the cows up to the livestock auction up in Westminster, Maryland. It also helps us build community as more and more people come to the farm and have that direct farm connection. 
In the spirit of building community, we also hold a festival on the farm each spring and each fall to get people who are shareholders purchasing meat in the local community out to the farm to see directly what it is we do there and how we grow things. We usually have some form of entertainment. This past year was the Trinidad and Tobago Steel Drum Band, which was the most fascinating group you can imagine. It's amazing the music they get out of those drums. And we always do a farm tour for anyone who's interested to show them the different parts of the farm where their food is being grown. Now, not everybody can get out to the farm. And food access is a big issue within food systems, whether it's local or you're thinking bigger picture. We work very closely on our farm with the Capital Area Food Bank, which is the food bank in the Washington, D.C. area. The food bank's mission is to deal with hunger and food access issues. It's a very big organization, deals with 500 agencies providing them food, these agencies being soup kitchens and shelters, to get food to people who really do not have access to it. One friend who works at the food bank, Ruben Gist, was telling us a story, and one of his roles at the food bank is to go into the local communities and let them know of the resources that are available to them in terms of education and also access to food. Ruben said one time he was visiting with a senior citizen who was on a fixed income, and he was sitting in her apartment talking with her about how she managed to live on this fixed income. And she kind of smiled and she pulled out for him a little booklet that she had made, tied together. It was just uh, simple pieces of paper tied together with a ribbon. And on each page was a recipe. And Reuben said as he looked through, he saw recipes for meatballs, for meatloaf, for chili. And he noticed that the base ingredient for each of these recipes was cat food. Now, you know, there's something wrong with the food system when someone is using cat food as the base for many of their recipes. She was proud of this recipe book and she said she shared it with all of the neighbors in her community. Food access is a key issue and it's an issue that we have to deal with and be aware of. Working with the food bank in DC, our farm, uh, which is owned by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation itself, has worked to develop a local farmer's market in Anacostia which is a low-income community on the edge of Washington, D.C. One thing that the federal government does do is provide farmer's market coupons to WIC recipients, the women and infant children, and also to seniors on fixed incomes. These farmer's market coupons can only be used at a fresh farmer's market. They can't be used at a grocery store. The point of the farmer's market coupons was to provide fresh produce and good nutrition to local communities where there wasn't access, but also to provide income to farmers and local farmers and stimulate local farm sales. Here are a couple of the farmers who sell with us down at the Anacostia Farmers Market. It's Dave Richards and uh, Cosby Doswell. Uh, they're pretty delightful fellas. They love this market. When I first told them about the market, they said, there's no way I'm going into that community to sell produce. They love it. It's a friendly atmosphere, and it's probably their favorite market. Again, as we look at the market and the local food system, we use the same criteria that we use for our farm. Does it build community? Is it building economic sustainability? Does it give control to the farmers? And you can see here, Dave and Cosby feel they got control. They really do by selling here at this market. Does it give control to consumers in their food choices? What about energy use? A local farmer's market surely reduces the travel that so much of our food has when we look at the average being 16 to 1800 miles for the food at your dinner table. You can reduce that mileage a whole lot when you buy at a local farmer's market. How does it fit into the ecological criterion? In this way, Consumers are buying local produce that is coming out of the fields in season. It's very different than eating tomatoes in December. As we think about local food systems, a lot of people will ask, well, can we really feed the world with these local food systems? And my feeling is it's probably the only way that in the long run we'll be able to feed the world. 
and it certainly is the place we need to begin to create the changes in the food system that we have. I hope you found this stimulating. It's been a pleasure to speak with you.